All right, so welcome to our second pick, meet, pick meeting of the 2021 school year. Um, we are recording this, and we are having a Zoom connection as well. And so hopefully all this technology works, and we have a good presentation today. One of the um, items we thought was relevant for the PIC committee or other parents to know about is a project we've been working on for a couple of years, um, trying to grow even further. Uh, during this pandemic and the dam failures, uh, something really dear to our heart and the social emotional learning aspects with our children. And it's become obviously even more and more needed uh, what, what, what is occurring today in our school environment as well. And from there, I am going to hand it right off to Ann Schaffner, our MTSS coordinator, who will be um, starting our presentation today. It's all yours, Ann, if you're there. Yep, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ann Sheffer, like Mike said. Um, I'm the MTSS coordinator for the district, and also joining me today is Allison Cicinelli, the secondary curriculum and instruction specialist, and Jen Service, who is the elementary curriculum and instruction specialist. Um, today, we're going to be talking about social emotional learning, um, and we may also refer to it as SEL at times, so I just want to give you that definition in advance. Okay, if we could go to the next slide, thank you. Um, I'm going to start by talking about MTSS, which stands for Multi-Tiered System of Supports. And this is basically grounded in the whole child framework, um, which we'll get into in a little bit more here in just a few slides. MTSS, um, it really requires us to deeply understand how our students are doing academically, socially, and emotionally so that we can deliver the right instruction, interventions, and supports at the right time when they're needed. MTSS is a framework um, that has an intended outcome of improving student achievement, increasing positive behavior and well-being, um, proactively addressing student needs, identifying those needs, um, preventing further identification of students um, needing special education services, and also providing research-based instruction within a positive school climate. So Michigan Department of Education identifies five essential components of MTSS um, as depicted in this graphic here on the screen. So that includes team-based leadership, comprehensive screening and assessment system, selection and implementation of instruction interventions and supports, continuous database decision-making, and a tiered delivery system. So a lot of our work is grounded within this framework. Social emotional learning is deeply rooted within MTSS as an integral part of the education and development. CASEL, um, which is the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, defines social emotional learning as the process. Process through which all young people and adults emotions and achieve personal and make responsible and caring decisions. And uh, sorry. And you're really breaking you up. Excuse me. Got a little little learning environments and experiences that feature the trusting and collaborative relations and meaningful curriculum and instruction. Let me grab one thing here. Yeah, she. I think. Got a little delay. We're having a few tech issues, but we'll get that straightened out. Is that better? Yeah, we were you were freezing up a little bit on this, and so I'm not sure we got all of it um, on this slide. On this particular slide? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so on this slide, really, we're just reviewing Castle's definition of social emotional learning. Um, it's this process which all people go through to acquire and apply knowledge, skills, and attitudes as they develop healthy identities, manage emotions, and achieve personal and collective goals, feeling and showing empathy for others, establishing and maintaining supportive relationships, and making responsible and caring decisions. Uh, the CASO 5 are the core competencies here that are listed. They are self-awareness, self-management, 
social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. And as this graphic shows, it's um, they're, they're really broad and interrelated with each other. So we can go to the next slide. So we're gonna break down these competencies a little bit for you. Self-awareness is defined as the ability to understand one's own emotions, thoughts, and values, and how they may influence behavior across contexts. Um, this can include the capacities and recognizing one's strengths and limitations with a well-grounded sense of confidence and purpose. Uh, so self-awareness may look like identifying those emotions, um, being able to name them, having, having an accurate self-perception, recognizing one's own strengths, having self-confidence, and ultimately self-efficacy. Um, it may sound like different phrases um, such as, how am I feeling and why, when am I at my best, when do I feel angry, uh, what stresses me out, and where might I fit into the big picture. Self-management um, is the ability to manage one's own emotions, thoughts, and behaviors effectively in different situations, and to achieve goals and aspirations. Um, this also includes the capacities to delay gratification, to manage stress, and feel motivation and agency to accomplish personal and collective goals. So again, self-management can look like impulse control, um, self-discipline, self-motivation, being able to set goals, um, and then organizing to do so. Self-management may sound like things like, I need a break right now, um, you know, may I have some space, I think I need help with, and then being able to articulate if they don't understand, um, but can do certain things to reach a goal. Social awareness is the ability to understand the perspectives of and emphasize with others, uh, including those from diverse backgrounds, cultures, and contexts. So this is being able to feel compassion, um, understand broader historical and social norms for behavior in different settings, and recognizing that family, school, and community resources have um, supports available. So again, social awareness looks like being able to take others' perspective, um, having empathy, appreciating diversity, and respect for others. Um, again, those phrases or those words that we might hear, what it might sound like is, how would I feel if I were in that situation? Or I wonder how that made so-and-so feel. Um, what is someone thinking? Those types of things. We could go to the next slide. Relationship skills um, is the ability to establish and maintain healthy and supportive relationships and to effectively navigate settings with diverse individuals and groups. So this includes the capacities to communicate clearly, listen actively, cooperate, work collaboratively to problem solve, and negotiate conflict conflict constructively. So again, this is communication. This is the relationship building and the teamwork, um, the active listening as, um, you know, as we're seeing in students. Relationship skills may sound like um, being able to say, can you explain what you mean by that? Or I disagree with you because, um, or again, just articulating different thoughts and, and questions. And finally, we have responsible decision making. And this is the ability to make caring and constructive choices about personal behavior and social interactions. Um, so this includes the capacities to consider ethical standards and safety concerns and to evaluate the benefits and consequences of various actions, um, you know, at a personal, social, and collective well-being uh, range. So this looks like identifying problems, being able to analyze situations to solve those problems, um, reflecting upon those problems, and taking into consideration that ethical responsibility. So it sounds like being able to analyze with how would this impact others? Is this something that's worth doing? Um, why am I making this choice? Or why do I want to make this choice? And, and essentially, like, is this a good choice to make? So if we go to the next slide, um, we have a short video here that we would like to share with you for social emotional um, learning and within parent context. And this comes from CASEL, um, which is this group that, you know, they've been doing research for about 26 years now on social emotional learning. And so here's the video.
Can you ask Ann? Um, I'm not hearing any sound. Okay, we are not either, Ann. Okay. So. Allison. Okay. All right. Let me let me hit play. Does this structure? Can you hear it or not at all? Here we go. Yeah, we can hear it now. Okay. Well, we better start over. <laughs> Parents, we know that there is more to raising a child than teaching reading, writing history and math. Raising a child means that schools and parents must work together to create safe and supportive environments while helping children to understand themselves, understand others, and make responsible decisions. It's important for children to see that they have role models that aren't always the ones that they expect to have. You know that saying that um, parents are the first teachers, that's, that's very true because I think that as a school, there's only so much that we can do. I think parent involvement in school is huge because I think it's really important when kids feel the partnership that their families have with the school. And so we work to have structures and systems in place that will help kids be able to do those things. Social and emotional learning, or SEL, is how children and adults understand and manage their emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. When adults are modeling SEL for students, whether it's parents or teachers or staff members, they're really building relationships with one another, which ultimately impacts how they work with one another as adults. I think it's really, really important for them to be self-aware. I think being able to identify their emotions and deal with them, it's sometimes really important to be able to stop and reflect. We're intellectual, emotional creatures. To learn the skills necessary, one has to have both a healthy internal life and external life. And so being self-aware of that is really critical. First of all, we have to learn how to manage our stress ourselves, how to deal with stress. In today's society where everything just seems to go 90 miles an hour, you have to just take a time out yourself. I mean, it's important for to be shown to him that there's different ways to deal with stressful situations. Teach them how to deal with emotions. Like, did we give them the skills to be able to handle conflict or resolve conflict? When kids are able to process their own feelings, acknowledge what's going on with others around them, not only for others, but for oneself, right? Forgiveness and what, what led to this? How might I do this differently? They have to have a sense of empathy. They have to have respect for other people of other cultures. I want him to learn how to interact with other kids, how to play, how to cooperate, how to do things together, also have fun. And I think that has been the best thing with my relationship with my daughter, that she's able to communicate well with others, speak her feelings. That's important because the world around us is all about relationships. Our children need to be able to guide themselves through there so that they can achieve those things that they need to achieve and be able to communicate them effectively. I'm always thinking about how are we potentially impacting students in a way that will make them think twice. Like, how are we helping them make good decisions? Starting to understand why do one thing instead of another, how it affects other people, explaining to him his actions have influence on his quality of life. I think our children need to be able to be confident enough to articulate what they're feeling and to be able to just showcase their strengths. Those five competencies apply to being successful anywhere. That's the kind of employee I'd like to work with. That's the kind of student that I'd like to have in my classroom. That's the kind of person I'd like to study with after school. And that helps build a positive climate and environment that sets the tone for learning. Research shows that SEL can have a positive impact on school climate and promote a host of benefits for students including better academic performance, improved attitudes about school, fewer negative behaviors like office referrals or drug and alcohol use, and reduced emotional stress. Every child can reach their full potential and are provided the supports and the resources that they need to reach that potential. My hope would be that families are engaged and feel welcomed at the school and can get the resources that they need through the school. In 
in order for students to meet their full potential academically, I think that you know, their social and emotional needs need to also be met. Social emotional learning is something that people can learn and that we can help to teach that. My wish or my hope is that schools see themselves as places of support for kids and families and community. We are their number one role model. Between modeling and direct engagement in their education and direct engagement with the school and the teachers and participating, the parents are the number one educator. Most strategies that mom and dad share with them are also the same strategies that schools have shared with them. As students learn social and emotional skills, it's important that they have opportunities to practice and apply those skills in real life situations, both at school and at home. One of the ways that parents can help children at home through the use of social emotional learning is to connect with the school. Whether it is attending local school meetings, parent teacher conference, emailing their teachers, I think it's just important in whatever way you feel you want to engage to do so. Parents can help bring SEL into the home in many ways. Here are five examples to consider. For self-awareness, take time to talk about feelings with your child every day by sharing your own feelings and asking your child to name their feelings as well. For self-management, teach and model positive ways of managing stress, disappointment, and anger. For social awareness, use story time to develop social awareness by asking your child how they would feel if they were in a similar situation as the characters in the story. For relationship skills, develop your child's ability to resolve a conflict by asking questions about the situation instead of giving advice. For example, try asking, what do you think your friend was feeling when that happened? Or how can you work to make things right? And finally, for responsible decision making, talk to your child about consequences by asking questions like, what might happen if you choose not to wear your coat if it's cold outside? Or how might your friend feel if you choose to cancel your plans to get together? us because it brings us all together. Social emotional learning is a journey we're all on until the day we die. We're all striving to be the best person we can be. My hopes and dreams are that my students just are able to fulfill their full potential in life. We need every child to be ready to take on whatever the world brings them. And social emotional learning and the strategies that teachers use to garner that will enable our children to get there. I just want them to be ready for the world and take it on and take it by storm. For more information on social and emotional learning, go to castle.org. Okay. So if you've been thinking about what resonated with you um, from watching that video, at the end of here, we are going to have a time to have a little bit of conversation. Um, so as we go on to the next slide, I'd like to put social emotional learning in the context of whole child and what whole child really means. Um, so this is an infographic um, that depicts the whole school, whole child, whole community model. And so when you hear the phrase whole child, this is really what we're referring to. In the middle there, you can see the student and then the words around it. And so we're saying that each student enters school healthy and learns about and practices a healthy lifestyle. Um, it also is showing that each student learns in an environment that is physically and emotionally safe uh, for students and adults. That each student is actively engaged in learning and is connected to the school and broader community. Um, that each student has access to personalized learning and is supported by qualified caring adults and that each student is challenged academically and prepared for success, um, you know, in college or career um, or life um, for employment and participation in our world. 
So um, from here, this is a good opportunity to um, introduce Jen Service, and she's going to talk to you about the alignment with PYP because many of these things are, um, you know, skills that are already being taught um, and integrated within PYP. Jen? Thanks. Hi, everyone. The International Baccalaureate aims to develop inquiring, knowledgeable, and caring young people who help to create a better and more peaceful world through inter intercultural understanding and respect. The primary years program, students become active, compassionate, and lifelong learners. The learner profile is the heart of the International Baccalaureate. It describes a broad range of human capacities and responsibilities that go beyond academic success. They imply a commitment to help all members of a school community learn to respect themselves, others, and the world around them. The learner profile aims to develop learners who are inquirers, knowledgeable, thinkers, communicators, principled, open-minded, caring, risk takers, balanced, and reflective. When learning about and through subjects, students acquire skills that best help them learn about those subjects. But beyond the subject area skills, there is a range of interrelated approaches to learning that are transferable across contexts. These skills support purposeful inquiry and set foundations for lifelong learning. The development of these skills is crucial in supporting students to effectively learn and succeed both inside and outside of school. The five interrelated approaches to learning are thinking, research, communication, social, and self-management. It is the aim of the IBPYP to support student agency and the development of cognitive and metacognitive skills and dispositions so that students view learning as something that they are doing for themselves in a proactive way rather than a covert event that happens to them in reaction to teaching. Together, the approaches to learning help students think, research, communicate, socialize, and manage themselves effectively. By combining the approaches to learning and the attributes of the IB learner profile, PYP students become self-regulated learners. Self-regulated learners are agents of their own learning. They know how to set learning goals, ask open-ended questions, generate motivation and perseverance, reflect on their own achievement, try out different learning processes, self-assess as they learn, and adjust their learning where necessary. By developing knowledgeable, conceptual understandings, skills, and attributes of the IB Learner Profile, our students learn how to make positive differences in their own lives, in their communities, and beyond. Our students are able to demonstrate the agility and imagination to respond to new and unexpected challenges. The IB Primary Years Program develops students' academic, social, and emotional well-being while focusing on international mindedness and a sense of belonging to both local and global communities. The PYP encourages every student to have voice, choice, and ownership in their own learning. By the sharing of this information, it is my hope that you can see the interconnectedness to all of our collective work and efforts. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Um, so it's really hard not to talk about social emotional learning without thinking about the impact of the, the past seven months. So the global pandemic, along with many other events that we've all experienced, um, have created multiple conditions that are favorable to trauma development in both our students and, our, and adults. Um, we know that social emotional learning can help children survive and cope, um, but not only that, really to persevere and thrive in these situations. Um, so when we think about this trauma development, we look at it at a universal level. And really universal means what's good for one is good for all. And so if it's best practice, you know, why don't, why don't we just do that? Um, and so having a trauma-informed environment looks at three pieces. It looks at creating a safe environment. Um, so again, not only physically but emotionally safe um, spaces and environments. 
um, building relationships and connectedness. So approaching kids with empathy and understanding and validating their feelings and behavior and, and really focusing on that relationship piece, that human element and connection. And then explicitly teaching and supporting students' social emotional learning and well-being. Um, so as we go to the next slide, CASEL um, identifies four focus areas for high quality systemic social emotional learning. And so just to share with you a little bit of information about what we're currently doing here at Midland Public, um, I believe it was last year this group we also presented on the RISE program. Um, and so we're really looking at that program and the idea of resilience and expanding that work within our elementary schools. Um, so we do have a few of them that are going through professional learning and professional development um, on, you know, for the teacher capacity um, and what that looks like at the classroom level and then again at the school level with policies and procedures being in place. Um, again, focusing on our adults and taking care of our teachers, really um, looking out for their well-being as well. Jen spoke a lot about PYP and promoting SEL through PYP um, because it's what we're doing. Um, so building that culture and expanding that work um, to really be authentic and explicit. And then practicing continuous improvement. We know that we're just getting started with all of this as well. So using um, the information that we're gathering, um, the data that we're collecting to really monitor if what we're doing is making a difference and to, to improve that over time. If we can go to the next slide. So ultimately, like I said, um, we're really focusing on resilience because we know that these protective factors can facilitate healing and the facilitate that resiliency. And that really, the healing, the healing occurs in the context of relationships. Um, so that culture piece is really um, important to us. So our core objective is to build these protective factors for our teachers and students to thrive. So if we go to the next slide, um, then Allison is going to take over from here. All right, thanks for the opportunity to share this information with you. And as Anne mentioned earlier, uh, we're kind of in the beginning stages of bringing a lot of these pieces together through continuous improvement, MTSS, SEL, trauma-informed, and we're in the process of aligning pieces. One of the conversations that we've had as a group is um, we're considering planning some family engagement opportunities in the future. And, and we're interested in hearing your responses uh, specifically to this presentation. It could be uh, as, as, as short as one word. Um, it could be more broad in terms of a paragraph. But what do you think that parents and families uh, would need or what would they find helpful uh, knowing that we're still in our information gathering stage just to trying to have a better understanding of where we are here in our community and what parents are thinking. And so we're hoping, and we do have a uh, sheet and I'll pull it up that has a few of the talking points aligned with each of the competencies, but we're hoping that you can share your thoughts with us. And this is our cheat sheet. Can you see it on the screen? We can, but it's, it's a little small, but we can see it. Is it? Okay. And I can I can read read it off, um, but this is our this is our location. Uh, Ann and Jen both have access to this one, and um, we're going to collectively take some notes if you are comfortable. But here's what we're thinking: We know that when we meet in these virtual environments, and we're learning along with our our teachers about what that best practice looks like, is we wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity uh, at the PIC meeting for for us to have some dialogue or conversation about the topic of SEL. And so we were thinking that there's a couple of different uh, ways that you can share. You can share in the chat. Uh, but we also would invite you to unmute and uh, have a conversation or uh, feel free to share your thoughts on where we are with this topic. And then uh, what you don't see is the very last slide. Um, well, there's two more slides, but one of the last slides that does have our email addresses, which we'll leave up at the end. So if uh, if you're not in the place where uh, it works well for you to either unmute or type your response in the chat, then um, then you can certainly email us. We don't want to put you uh, on the spot right here. So there's several different places or ways that uh, we're just looking for a response to the presentation and um, understanding where we might be right now, knowing that we have um, are in the midst of a pandemic. We've had. Um, just the, the flood here in Midland and, and a lot going on. So we want to better understand where, where we are. So um, if anyone wants to share. 
Allison, I do see a, um, a question in the chat, but I don't have it. Cindy, do you have that? Yep. Um, Betsy Deagle is asking, so how specifically are we focusing on resiliency in MPS 2021 planning for teachers and students? Okay. Um, so I'll start with that. Um, like I said before, the relationships piece and that cultural piece is, is really important to us. So um, I know that our teachers, a lot of our teachers, well, all of our elementary teachers actually um, went through some professional learning prior to school beginning um, to talk about some of the trauma and ACEs work and different strategies. Um, as we talk about that, you know, human element, we knew that we had to really focus on building community coming back from um, the shutdown coming back to school this year. So many of our teachers have engaged um, students in like social stories and, and really just focusing on that classroom um, community and culture. Um, we have ongoing professional learning. We, again, we know that we have to um, build capacity to get this work going. Would anybody else like to add on to that? And the RISE training um, and the number of staff that have heard that, we've been in that for um, at least three years, I think, at Central Park and in the rest of the elementaries. Yep, so I think since 2018, um, the resiliency work with the RISE program. And like I said, uh, originally that started out at Central Park and we are expanding that across the district. So we're doing that in stages um, to build that capacity. So we have, right now we have four elementary, four additional elementary buildings going through professional learning and um, assessments for that. And then the, the next step will be to add on the other elementary buildings. Um, RISE stands for Resiliency in Students and Educators. Um, and so it starts with the professional learning for the teachers. It's a coaching model um, where we have uh, supports going in to help teachers like kind of in the moment and then some structured reflection. Again, those SEL skills that we're, you know, monitoring and offering for our students, um, that's what we're trying to model for our adults as well. The other thing that pops in my mind a little bit that we might want to talk about is our student support specialist, Penny or Ian. <laughs> Yep, so we do have two student support specialists. Um, their, their work right now is in relation to RISE and resiliency. So they, um, they were hired in addition to this, this funding source that we received from Michigan Department of Education. So they're the ones going in and helping to facilitate this professional learning for teachers and staff and to go into classrooms and help kind of coach and support. Um, in addition, they work with individual students as needed or small groups if needed as well. Sure, good job, very good. Um, what we're looking at this morning and in our infancy here, especially with that resiliency piece and how important that is, are we looking at this more as referrals or case by case or blanketed or, you know, infused right into the curriculum per se? Betsy, that was very hard to understand. Yeah. What I think I heard was that she was going to type it. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Um, so as Betsy's typing up, um, her question or comment, um, what other thoughts might, uh, might you have that you would be willing to share with us? We do have something from Dr. Bender. Okay. It says it might be helpful to provide parents with a handout that compiles your what it sounds like items for the various SEL competencies. Yep, I, I'd be happy to do that and put that kind of on a one pager. If I sent that to you, Cindy, would you be able to um, get that out there? Happy to. Okay, thank you. Um, and the other, the other piece I was thinking about is the no, numerous items you've put in the communique, uh, parents mm -hmm. have said about um, wellness or um, SEL. Yep, we've been trying to weekly um, put in different articles or um, activities or suggestions um, that may be helpful for families. Um, we also have a lot of area agencies that are providing different opportunities that we're trying to share as well. 
Betsy Deagle came back and she said, internet connection issues, <laughs> tis a season, I think. Um, great job to the team. What community partnerships are you considering bringing in for expertise regarding SEL and resiliency? And Ann, right off the bat, pop in my head, maybe you can explain that RISE is a partnership with SVSU. Yep, um, so SVSU was originally partnership with SVSU, or I'm sorry, RISE was originally partnership with SVSU, and so we're continuing that work um, with Sarah Owens. And we've also been doing some work with The Rock um, as a nonprofit youth development organization. Um, I just recently was speaking to someone at the Community Foundation, and as we start to engage um, some of our other nonprofits like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, um, or anyone that also have um, any, again, opportunities or things available in the community that we can connect um, parents and families to. I, I want to add to that one as well. I know that um, Steve uh, Poole, Dr. Steve Poole, has been working with the counselors, um, but when I was working a little bit with, with that particular group, we partnered uh, pretty often with community mental health. I know that they were working with some of the connections that, it, that they have. A lot of that part is probably behind the scenes and something that wouldn't be typically seen by, by the public as we identify needs for students as they're working with their student support specialist or being referred to outside programs based on their need. And I know that that was something even prior to the pandemic that we were focusing on starting last year. And I know Anne has been uh, working with counselors on some of those pieces as well. So, and part of the focus on that was working specifically with what 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 partnerships, especially here in Midland, where we have so many great uh, great connections, great support in in our community to reach out. What connections do we have? What what might be we be able to bring in from uh, a mental health standpoint, but not just that, but uh, giving students uh, the opportunity to have access to some of our other programs. And so yeah. working with the ISD, mm -hmm. I know that that was one of the things we talked about. Yeah, that mental health uh, coalition, we were one of the original members and going back three, four years, because I sat on it and I handed it off to Penny and we handed it off to Christy Hainstock and I don't know, and if you've been involved yeah. a little bit, but there's many <laughs> partners at that table from uh, Partners in Change, fam Children and Family Services, to Community Mental Health, all uh, working on trainings for, for our staff, um, programs, curriculum that we've tried in our classrooms, I'm trying to think of the Minds Up curriculum and some of the other pieces that we've done through the last few years in those partnerships as well. I was wondering how long the uh, relationships or the um, engagement with SVSU and so forth are planned for and then if there are funds that were specifically given how long is that for and then has there been discussion on how to continue to implement this on a 5, 10, 15, 20 year plan? Yeah. Yep, so um, it's a really good question. And again, our focus too is also on sustainability. So um, we're going through a train the trainer model. So we're training our um, staff internally so that they can continue to train with internally um, as we continue to expand this work. A little bit about um, the funding there as far as our student support specialists. And so our state has been um, trying to parlay some state funded dollars into more Medicare dollars in order to um, increase what a category called 31N. And Penny and Brian are probably a little more school on than I am at this point, but it is dollars that we will continue to grow as a state between the federal dollars and state dollars to put more student support specialists into the classroom to support our students' needs in the MTSS or SEL areas. Yeah, I would agree. If you think back to the early slides that Ann shared, building the tiered system of support in a classroom. So it is about the universal approach of all students having access to uh, the curriculum, to this experience, to build their skill. And then what Mike's referring to is that tiered approach. So when we have students who need a bit more support, uh, we have staff on hand who are ready to provide that support or to Allison's point, we have a, a very in-depth referral process out to our community partners. So we're really trying to build a system that we can sustain long term, even if grant funding goes away, we're building the capacity of our teachers, 
of our administrators. We're focusing on their overall wellness. So when you are well as the adult in the classroom and you have these skills and you reinforce those regularly, you're better equipped to support students. So it really is a, a more holistic approach than just putting some people in a classroom to work with kids. Uh, we're trying to be really thoughtful about how we can live into this and, and make it last. And on that funding side, our state legislators and our Michigan Department is very committed to those dollars, uh, knowing that um, mental wellness is something that is going to be an emphasis for us for quite some time. So I don't expect those dollars to go away. I expect them to increase. We have had a couple of comments um, from Dr. Deagle. Um, she says, keep up the pointed focus. This is so needed for our teachers, staff, and students. I am very passionate about this topic. Thank you. And then from Dr. Bender, when students have behavioral lapses, you might want to encourage your principals and teachers. Let's see, went away. Your um, principals and teachers to address those issues in the context of the SEL framework and encourage directed feedback that aligns to interventions designed to promote SEL competencies. And then from Adrienne Saligar, are there plans looking forward to engage all students on more regular basis with these types of discussions, really building relationships between students and students and teachers, administrators at all levels, elementary through secondary? Um, so I would say yes, yes, yes. Thank you for all of those comments. Um, <laughs> Dr. Bender, yes, absolutely. As we're focusing too on our tiered system of support um, for students who may need additional interventions, yes, we would like to um, put it back in the frame of SEL, um, align it back to that. Um, for the last um, message that just came in, there's a question about um, plans for looking forward to engage, engaging all students. Um, Yes, as part of our continuous improvement process as we designate time and training um, to do that and really the authenticity behind that, we, you know, it, it's a process and so this is us just getting started knowing that um, we will be improving. But yes, the plan is to expand programming for K-12. We have had some preliminary uh, conversations about the end vision through continuous improvement and MTSS about what potential universal supports, but um, as as Anne alluded to, we're kind of in the early the early parts of that, but we have talked about universal supports as well as which would be for everybody, um, and as well as some of the interventions that would be more aligned with specific needs. And also just navigating with um, the you know limitations that are set before us right now with you know students being able to gather and be together and and adults for that you know for that matter as well. So. Um, we're having to be creative and, and our teachers are designing things that, you know, on a daily basis here, so. These are great thoughts, great feedback, great questions, and I don't want to slow us down. Uh, is there anything else that we want to make sure that we um, write down so that we have uh, captured any of those thoughts? And as we mentioned earlier at uh, the last slide, when, when we get to that portion, when Ann uh, wraps us up, there is a place for email. So knowing that you just came into this and oftentimes as you leave and think about and reflect on, on things that you've, you've seen, I know in, in a lot of social media, there's been a lot of focus on some of the SEL. They might not call it that or term it that, that, that you're aware of. If you have any other great, great thoughts or um, pieces that you want to share, we're going to share our, our email addresses and we can certainly add that as well. We do have another thought from Dr. Bender. He asks, which code of ethics will guide efforts coming under social awareness to promote ethical responsibility? I'm not sure I understand the question, uh, Ann or okay. Allison, are you understanding? Uh, I can offer to you all, there is uh, on the MDE page, there is a code of ethics for educators. It was recently released yeah. from the Department of Ed and it speaks to our responsibility in this particular area. Is there something more specific you're inquiring about Dr. Bender?
Uh, well, I, <clears throat> I just saw that uh, ethical responsibility was one of the items listed under ah. self awareness. And so if you're going to promote ethical responsibility, then that presupposes that there's been some code of ethics that's, that's guiding them. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know which code of ethics that might be. Yeah, so there is a teacher code of ethics as part of the Department of Education's document. And Anne, I'll let you address that within the CASEL model. I think we're just, we're starting to surface what that actually means for us. So yes. we might not have all the details yet. Okay. So we do good. I think we're ready to move on, Anne, and then I'll go for you. Okay. A long pause there. Sorry. My wait time's not too good. I, uh, I was just going to say that was um, that is the end of our presentation. So we, we do also, you know, again, want this continuous feedback and, and information. So feel free to email us or drop it in the chat um, so that we can take that information as we continue this planning. Yeah, that's kind of where I was going to go, too, is... You know, our um, attendance uh, for PIC has decreased with COVID, as you might expect. And um, so we started over a year ago taping these. And of course, we're getting a little better with the extra taping we're doing with Zooming coming in, taping, recording, and trying to get it out there. So bear with us. I think we're getting better at it. But um, encourage parents to view those. They're on our website. And I know some are uncomfortable uh, coming. And then we have never found the perfect time to connect with parents because often after school, you're so busy running your children to other things um, and early in the morning, get off to work. And so if for years, lunchtime worked uh, in a business community, but it still seems like our participation has dropped. It's open to anybody who would like to come, encourage them to come, but then please encourage them to view it and then provide more feedback. So we're looking for more feedback than that as we continue to venture down this process. So, and then, and I think as the comment said today, this is vital, you know, it's been vital for a while. And we certainly have, uh, as educators for a long time, realized that we've seen a lot more children come in school who need resiliency, who, who've had some trauma in their life. And so uh, with brain research, this continues to get stronger and stronger and applying it to our profession and our craft. Anything else, any closing statements for anybody? Mr. Sherrill, I do yep. um, just want to mention that um, we do not have PIC meetings in November and December because of the holidays. So we'll look forward to seeing our PIC um, parents again in January. And Cindy, do you remember the topic in January? Um, I don't know if that's totally been decided yet. Okay, <laughs> sorry, we will get that out to you soon. So hopefully we're picking good topics and there's things that you're you think we're missing, you can let us know that feedback as well. And again, thanks for coming and let us have your lunch time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. What are the...